of the Scottish Parliament. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here to the heart of this fantastic building uh, for the 11th annual St Andrew's Day uh, debate. I'd like to offer a particular warm welcome to our finalists um, and indeed to the other teams who join them on the floor of the debating uh, chamber today. I know you've travelled from all over uh, the country, from Elgin, South Dumfries uh, in the southwest and just about everywhere uh, in between. And so uh, to do that on a cold and dark autumn evening such as this, uh, I commend you all uh, for that. It must have been a long day and I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, today's competition has been organised in partnership with the English Speaking Union and Education Scotland and I'd like to extend my uh, thanks to everyone involved from both of those organisations uh, for their efforts in making this annual event the success uh, that it is. The quality of debate seems to improve uh, year on year and I'm sure our 11th competition will be the best uh, of the lot, so no pressure on contributors today. Uh, this chamber, of course, as you'll be aware, has witnessed many debates uh, over the years since its establishment, uh, from the very consensual and sometimes fairly mundane and pedestrian debates uh, to pretty heated and impassioned debates about matters of real import uh, to the people of Scotland. But no matter the kind of debate we're having, uh, I think successful debaters share one important quality, and that's a, a willingness to listen uh, and to engage constructively uh, with their, or their opponents. And so a tip from me, uh, not that I'm the greatest debater in the world, far from it, but simply turning up the volume uh, is not, in my view, a winning strategy in any debate. I'm sure many of you would share that observation. Uh, to quote the South African Nobel Peace Prize winner, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, don't raise your voice, improve your argument. I think those are wise words. And so with its unique pairing uh, up of school pupils with university students, these championships offer a valuable opportunity for pupils to hone their debating skills and also an opportunity for students to do likewise, as well as to develop coaching and mentoring skills. But more than that, I hope it allows all participants to simply enjoy themselves, to enjoy debate uh, and to enjoy themselves here in the Scottish Parliament this evening. So on behalf of my parliamentary colleagues, can I once again welcome you to our wonderful building here. And I am pleased to say that we're also joined today by the Scottish Government's Minister for International Development and Europe, Alistair Allen, MSP. And I would like to ask him to come forward to the podium and say a few words. Thank you, Alistair. Well... Thank you very much, Andy. I, some of you have clearly discovered that we have a tradition, or some of us do in this chamber, of, of hammering our desks in front of us. We have the advantage over the House of Commons that not only do we all have a, a chair, but we all have a desk in front of us as well. It is slightly strange for me to be standing here uh, because I don't think I've ever faced the Parliament looking in this direction, and it is quite, quite daunting. Unlike a number of uh, parliaments around the world, here we, 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 um, we speak from, from our own seat. So it's strange to be looking this day, but I'm delighted uh, this, this way. But I'm delighted that you're here today, uh, and you've you've taken the opportunity uh, to to mark the final of the 2017 St Andrew's Day debating tournament. Now, St Andrew's Day itself provides us with a, a great opportunity to celebrate Scotland's culture, uh, to celebrate our communities and our values, and it is, of course, also simply a, an opportunity for the nation to enjoy itself. So I hope you have had the chance to do that in the course of this uh, competition, daunting though it may have seemed at times. Through debate, um, we can consider the world around us by thinking about different arguments, engaging with opposing views, exploring new ideas, uh, and doing so in a spirit of collaboration uh, and friendship. So as you all progress through this competition uh, and into the challenges uh, of your careers and lives ahead, uh, I would encourage you all to continue to use what I hope are, and I'm sure are, the great debating skills that you've all demonstrated here today uh, to help you make your own positive difference uh, in your lives ahead. I would like to close to, to thank the team at the English Speaking Union for organising today's tournament and also colleagues at the Scottish Parliament for hosting the event. I have myself very happy memories of the English Speaking Union and their school's public speaking and debating competitions from my time at Selkirk High School. Uh, I am very, uh, specifically, I have very happy memories of the 1986 competition. Uh, and can I take this belated opportunity to thank our coach, uh, Mr. Slater, our English teacher. So can I um, also, more importantly, uh, wish you all a happy St Andrew's Day, La uh, and also take the opportunity to wish you all uh, good luck in this competition. 
Uh, this is going to be, or 2018 is going to be the year of young people for Scotland. So today's event is a great way to celebrate both St Andrew's Day and the coming year ahead. Again, I wish you all the very best in the competition ahead uh, and I look forward to hearing a great debate tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Um, before I introduce the finalists, uh, I'd like to introduce the judges. Uh, chairing the judging panel will be Richard Wilkins. Do you want to stand up, Richard, so that everyone can see you? That's fine. You can sit down just so you can see you. That'd be grand. Uh, Richard's a long history of debating, having won the John Smith University's MACE with Edinburgh University in 1999. In 2000, he founded the ASU Juniors Debating Competition, and from 2004 to 6, he coached the Scottish Schools Debating Team. His current job is within the First Minister's policy team for the Scottish Government. Next, we have Alex Orr. Alex? Yep. Excellent. Alex is Managing Director of Public Relations and Public Affairs Company Orbit Communications, a trustee of the English Speaking Union and also a board member of the European Movement in Scotland. He's a lifetime follower of the Scottish Rugby Team, I'm told, and Secretary of Liberton FP Rugby Club, so he must be in a fairly good mood about that just now. Uh, and next I'd like to introduce Gabrielle Elise, a student at the University of Edinburgh. She's currently the university's debating union schools convener and has judged at Edinburgh University Schools competition and Edinburgh Juniors final. She was also an Edinburgh Cup breaking judge and uh, has broken at Bogwall Trinity Women's Scottish Mace Championships of Poland and was schools champion of Poland. For those in the know, to break means you are in the top tier of judges. So well done, Gabriela. Also the joining the panel, we have Connor Keir, who currently studies at the University of Dundee. In the four years since he's been judging schools competitions, he's been to more places than the proclaimers can name in letters to America, he claims. Uh, Connor's been judging the ESU Scotland for the past three years and has judged the final of the Scottish Schools Mace for the past two years and has very kindly run the tab for the whole tournament today. The St Andrews Day debate encourages pupils to join <coughs> the, uh, the judging panel for all the debates held throughout this event, so I'm delighted to welcome Aidan Shields. Thank you, Aidan, uh, from Craigmount High School as the last member of our judging panel. Thank you all. I'd like now to congratulate and to introduce the four teams that have made it to the final. Uh, the first team are Luca Del Pipo from Perth High School and Rue Ferguson from St Andrews University and will be known as Perth Ferguson. Welcome. Next, we have Doar Shabir and High School of Glasgow and Mark Wilson from University of Edinburgh, who will be known as HSOG Wilson. <laughs> we also have Duncan Riedel from Queensferry High School and Robin Lawrence from University of Glasgow and will be known as Queensferry Lawrence. And finally, we have Amy Baxter from Clifton Hall School and Henry Vickle from University of Edinburgh, will be known as Clifton Vickle. So to, before we begin, I'd like to out, outline the format of the debate. Uh, I will call on the first proposition to speak, and they have five minutes. I will then call on the first opposition speaker to speak, and they also have five minutes, and this is repeated for each speaker. During these eight speeches, I will verbally announce when your first minute is up, and this will indicate that points of information are now permitted. I'll also verbally indicate when you've entered your last of the five minutes in which no more points of information will be allowed. And when you're five minutes up, I will ask you to wind up if you have not already wound up. The clocks are in the chambers here. You'll be able to see your timings. Uh, and again, we'll be asked for you to wind up uh, very promptly. So please do use the clocks in the chamber for references. These will be timing you. And I'd ask all speakers also to sit, uh, to present from their current position, not sit, stand, but to present from your current position. Now, after the final speech for the opposition, I'll ask the judges to retire to make their decision. And at this point, we'll open the debate up to the floor for 30 minutes. I hope that everyone possible will participate in the floor debate. We've only got 30 minutes and many, many speakers. So it won't be possible for everyone to contribute. Uh, and there will be an award for the best contribution from the floor. The motion for today's final is, this House believes that individuals have a right to a basic income regardless of capacity or willingness to work. So now on to the final, and I wish you all the best of luck. I would like to call the first speaker from Perth Ferguson to open the debate as the first proposition speaker.
Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we, the Scottish Government, are already in the process of trialling universal basic income in council areas across Scotland. What we propose is that we, A, continue to, set, continue to do this in order to determine an appropriate amount. You know, we're thinking kind of like around the national living wage. Um, everyone will be entitled to this after they leave school at the age of 18. In my speech, I'm going to cover automation, the consequences of automation, and how our proposal effectively deals with these consequences. So without further, further ado, automation. This is a phrase that is often, you know, like kind of an automated response, ironically, from economists when we kind of ask what we're going to see in the future in the world of economics. We see that jobs are going to be lost. This is the overwhelming response. Jobs are going to be lost and will continue to be so. Why? We're seeing not just hammer, ha you know, like job, uh, robots that just hammer out cars cutting manufacturing jobs anymore. We're seeing near sentient beings with intelligent, uh, artificial intelligence replacing care workers, nurses, who knows, maybe even judges and ministers. The point of this is that we will see jobs cut on a massive scale. The, uh, why? A, you're going to reduce labour costs. Oh, sorry, I'll take your point now. If automation meaningfully threatens society, why not just ban it? Sorry? Why not ban automation? Because we think that, you know, it's like an economic force. You're not going to be able to ban it. If you ban it here, other countries will do it and you'll see capital flight and that's just generally bad for the economy and will actually create more unemployment. So we see that this, uh, our proposal stands. So first of all, the reason why companies do this is A, it reduces labour cost because AI can be mass produced. B, you can cheaply mass produce because of economies of scale and says law in economics, companies will benefit from mass production of artificial intelligence and through artificial intelligence. And C, a robot can't sue a company. A robot doesn't have rights. They can make them work 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and it will not have any qualms about it. It is a robot. It is artificial intelligence. So when we look at the impact of this on the opposition side of the house, we see it is an oligopoly. That is to say, a small number of companies controlling an overwhelmingly disproportionate amount of capital within the economy and having huge amounts of influence compared to your normal consumer in what determines market forces. Now, because this happens because you're reducing labour costs and because of your rapid investment in AI as companies start to make more and more profit from not paying workers robots. So we see that um, as a result of this, people are going to become a lot poorer. We're going to see job loss, obviously. We're going to see declining opportunity to work. We're going to see a very centralised and very minute amount of people actually working and able to work as most of the job market becomes automated by robots or artificial intelligence. We also see that mortgage payments go unpaid. This is, this, this is, uh, no thank you. This tackles your single mother who needs, you know, works all the hours God sends them to provide for three children. This is going to be, this is the type of person this is going to be affecting because most of the jobs in society will become automated over time. Only on our side of the house do we see that the those, these people are protected from poverty. Yeah. What you've just outlined there for us is people who do not have the capacity to find a job in the current labour market. You're not outlining the people, mention the motion, who are not even willing to work. Okay, when we talk about the people that aren't actually willing to work, we see that it still stands because, you know, we don't, at the same time, we can actually relate it to, like, the right to life. Even if they're not willing to work to the point of where they're actually going to starve, we see that they still have the right to life under the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Therefore, it is our responsibility as a government to make sure they have enough income to live a decent life. So when we ask, like, look, uh, when we ask economists what's going to happen because of this, we get the response like, look, this is going to be worse than the Great Depression in terms of mass unemployment and poverty. And this isn't just speculative, this isn't just an assertion. We're seeing this from Christine Lagarde, the head of the IMF, and we're also seeing it from Thomas Piketty, who's not the head of the IMF, but he's still a very esteemed economist, so the point kind of still stands. We propose a UBI in, in solution to this. Wow. We see that this will create a, a fiscal multiplier. This will increase economic growth, boost job growth as we see economic growth rising. We also see that it will allow people to have a say in what happens in the market, not just the minority with jobs. We also concede that there will still be jobs available. It will allow people to live while re, like, re seeking retraining. They can go into the job market that's like still not un unautomated. So that it will allow them to live while they seek retraining if they so wish. And secondly, uh, thirdly, it will create a financial and social equality by giving everyone enough to live on. We will see drastically, in, uh, we will see a drastic improvement on the Gini coefficient in Scotland. So I, uh, the trade-off is essentially, even if we accept that this policy will create debt in the short run, it, you know, it will prevent the mass poverty derived from unemployment that is created by automation, and we think that is more important than anything that the opposition can provide us with tonight. I beg you to propose. Thank you.
Thank you very much indeed. And for keep, keeping to time, remind all speakers that there are clocks here. You can time yourself. So I'd very much now, now would like to call the first speaker from HSOG, Wilson, to respond as the first opposition speaker. Five minutes. <laughs> Ladies, gentlemen and esteemed chair, today Ido Shabir, I'm proud to open the case for side opposition for the motion, this house believes that um, all citizens have a right to universal basic income regardless of capacity or willingness to work. But first I'd just like to offer some rebuttal um, and take some issue with some points made by, first, um, by opening government. Um, one thing I found that um, I think he was mentioning in his, in his speech is the fact that like human beings have a basic right to life, which we totally agree with and we totally recognise on side opposition. However, what we see is that what the government is entitled to, is obliged to do, what people are entitled to is their basic human rights and the means to be able to access them if they do not have the capacity to. So the part of this motion, like you have a right for universal basic income if you don't have the capacity to, we do agree that like the government's responsibility is to give you the means to be able to do things which would um, like allow you to have things like food, like shelter, like basic human needs. However, we feel that once One a minute. Um, so we feel that like once a government gives you this thing, then after that, if you are willing to take it or not, is up to, is your responsibility. So, for example, if the government provides all citizens with a job, point to the example of a place like India. In places of rural India, people have been guaranteed with it. No, thank you. Guaranteed with a job for the government. If they take it or not, that's their decision. That is their willingness. But however, from that, the government is not entitled to provide them with like things that would like allow them to be able to like sustain living if they have not decided to take the means already provided to them. On to my substantive case, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first of all, I'd just like to outline that this, gov this motion is about we believe, like, if we believe it's a human right or not. And like, so we could support the motion otherwise. We could support basic income otherwise. However, we do not think it's a right that everyone is entitled to. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the main cases um, that like, I'd like to outline in my, in my um, substantive case of my speech, no thank you, is the idea of like taxation and how that will impact the taxation on consumers on consumers who do participate within the labour market. So ladies and gentlemen, on side opposition, we liken taxation to theft. And that's because as a member of society, I do not choose whether I want to give taxation or not. You may argue that I have chosen to be in the society, I have not chosen to be in society. And um, in, a in a democracy, my vote does only count if I'm breaking a tie. In the grand scale of things, my vote is insignificant so that I do not contribute to the democratic running of the society. In this way, paying tax is not my option. To pay tax to the government, I'll take in just a sec, to pay tax to the government, I have agreed that I have to work, I have to provide my labour to the government in order to pay tax. Yes, please? I'm more than happy to have 0% taxation and borrow all the money. Um, sorry, I don't understand your point, could you? We're more than happy to have 0% taxation and borrow all the money needed. However, I think that like that's an extremely harmful thing to say that you would borrow all the money because I think that doesn't work on many different levels because of the idea of like it introduces a lot of debt. So, but like as a society, we already accept that like transfer payments do occur. Like to fund state education, say for example, we have taxation. So, like for me to pay the government, as I've said, I've accepted I have to provide my labour. Therefore, the money I provide to the government is the equivalent to my, my labour. So say for example, if we in introduce an incentive like a universal basic income for all, that means I may have to work an extra hour to, tra to provide this and transfer payments to the government. The only justification, ladies and gentlemen, for me to pay tax, for me to engage in transfer payments, is if we're protecting a more fundamental right. So let's say for example, some people's like, lives are at risk. That means that like, I, I am justified and I will give like, my income, and that's something we agree on as a society. However, the marginal benefits from this are very little, because basically what I have to do One is I have to, to work in order to allow other people to have the luxury of not working. And essentially, that's taking my labour and giving it to others in the society. Ladies and gentlemen, what does this do to my labour? It essentially, it devalues it. And this is like, we say that this is akin to theft because I have accepted that I have to be willing to work. It, because I have the capacity to work, I then have to decide that I am willing to work. And to then have that, like, to then have that acceptance, that like agreement I've made with society exploited by the concept, like, like there's 
a sect of society who are able to not work and still get a universal basic income, we think is ludicrous. Because of, as, as I've already outlined, the basic human right is not actually to like an income. The basic human right is to things like food, education, like shelter, clothing. These basic human rights, right, the government, as I've said, ha only is obliged to, to provide the means. Wind up, please to provide the means to that. So then if people are not willing to take that means, then that is their responsibility, and therefore I am not liable to provide that by selling my labor to the government, and so it is devalued for me and it becomes meaningless. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Beg you to oppose. Thank you. Can I now call the second proposition speaker from Perth Ferguson to the debate. Okay, Mr. Speaker, or should I say, presiding officer. Imagine a world where artificial intelligence replaces swathes of human vocations. Imagine a world where your neighbor, your community, and your family solely see, solely see the deflation of their living standards. Imagine a world where mass unemployment and poverty is the norm. This is a world you need not imagine. If we continue to abdicate responsibility, that is reality we face. What we are proposing on proposition on the government side, ladies and gentlemen, is that we harness the benefits of artificial intelligence, the wealth that it brings, to bring a better tomorrow. I've got a couple of points. First of all, I'll tell you how we can harness that technological change for that better tomorrow I was talking about. I think I'll talk about why we should not fear technological progress, but we should embrace it. And finally, I'll talk about the trade-offs. But first of all, I'll talk about some rebuttal. Now, the, the point that we got from the last speaker in a very good speech said, to, but what about the people not willing to work? One we, say, we say, A, right? That's their decision, especially if it's unrewarding, right? Lots of jobs are terrible, right? If you're completely replaceable, you have cruel management and dire pay, that's a fair trade-off that you, like, you're reasonable in your position to make. Um, as we'll talk about later, we are one of the wealthiest nations on earth, right? And we are going to get richer because of artificial intelligence. Costs are going to go down when we automate things, but the trade-off of that, no thank you, um, I'll take you later, is going to be that there's going to be a higher amount of unemployment. We propose taking the money that we get from the savings that we'll make and the reductions of costs and giving that to the people who need it so they can live a fulfilling life. How do we do that? We tell you, first of all, we can harness that technological change because we live in a society with a couple of problems. We say, we, in our society today, we have too many people living in squalid conditions. We say, A, because our welfare provisions are not designed for the long term. They're designed for a short-term stopgap. But since so many jobs, even things like uh, legal work, clerical work, jobs which were considered uh, accountancy work, jobs that are uh, traditionally considered middle management jobs, these can now be automated. Right? We see at that point, when these people go into mass unemployment, they might not be able to find jobs to replace them, especially if they're of a middle age. But we say, B, a lot of jobs today are not compensated and should be compensated. If you think of that single mother who's looking after her children and she's stretched while she's on tax credits or universal credit, right, while the rich see their taxes fall and their profits increase, we, should, we say she should be fairly compensated for her work. So how do we address such problems and why should we not fear technological change? We're not Luddites on government. We're not afraid of progress and we will not be cowed by billionaires or oligarchs. If each and every single one of you had the financial resources to create promise, you'd also ignore the warnings and take their sweet, rich apple from the Silicon Valley Garden of Eden. And we certainly would do that, and if it requires sending, so be it. Why do we get richer? We say, A, as talked about my partner, things like economies of scale. Right? When, when I buy a coffee machine and I make one coffee, this is the econ example, sorry to bore you all, but when I have one coffee, that's a relatively high cost because I've had to invest a lot of money buying that coffee machine. But if I make hundreds of coffees and I only need one machine and little inputs, the average cost of that cup goes down. 
That's the principle of artificial intelligence. When I make something in masses, the costs are reduced. So when we're talking about things like, um, like courier delivery services and Amazon are looking at things like drones, we say because the costs fall, you're going to have this mass unemployment. There are millions and millions and millions of people who work in the courier industry. At the point where they're all replaced by drones and the costs are much cheaper, we say the prices of things will go down because they no longer have to cost, pay the cost of the drivers who are having to drive out those deliveries. All they have to do is program it into a machine. We One say minute. at the point where we tax those things and we get the revenues back, we're likely to be able to redistribute it. But we, we say this technology is much quicker than we are. You do not have to train a robot for 21 years of your life. It does not get hangovers. It does not need eight hours of sleep per night. It does not need to be an annoying student like me. You can make it work 24 hours a day. We say we can simply cannot compete against sentient objects and machines who are able to do those sorts of tasks. This is the trade-off that we face, ladies and gentlemen. Do we want to work for artificial intelligence or do we want technology to work for us? We say, and I've already told you throughout my speech, that there are too many people in our society when we can clearly afford to look after them, to protect them, to give them a decent standard of life that are left in the fringes and the margins of our society. We say we take hold of the advantages. We do not see technology as something that we should be afraid of, but something that we should harness and benefit to our own gain. In the short term, if there's some costs, if our deficit has to increase slightly, if our national debt, which is going up anyway, increases another couple of percentage points, we say we're willing to wait, Why we're willing not, to make people's lives better, and we're proud to be in the government side. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I now ask the second opposition speaker from HSOG Wilson to speak? Five minutes. We were all born into states arbitrarily, and at every stage in our life, those states make decisions that fundamentally affect the kind of choices we make. At no point do we get to meaningfully consent into those systems. We didn't decide we were born. There was no contract who signed at any point which said, yes, I want to be Scottish or British or American. At no point do you get, as an individual, to decide if the laws of those states apply to you. So you may get to vote in an election, but unless there's a very close tie, your vote isn't going to determine whether or not those laws apply to you. We say as a result, all states operate as dictators onto their individuals and must be deeply careful about the kinds of policies they enact. Some framing in this debate. First, this is the This House Believes debate about whether or not universal income or basic income is itself a right regardless of willingness. This is not a debate about whether or not basic income would be strategically useful to solve some of society's problems, or who we think it's a good policy idea. One I'm sorry, opening government, but you've already lost this debate. Second, we're happy to support a world in which the government provides you access to a job, a useful job, hopefully, but one which allows you to generate revenue, a living wage, and here's the basic standards of society, allowing you to access all of your basic and fundamental rights, like freedom, like education, and like food, but which requires you to be willing to work in order to access those things. We're happy if you don't have capacity for you as an individual to not be required to work. I think that's reasonable. Fundamentally then, why are we winning this debate? First, what my partner's outlined to you is that the act of taxation itself commands a theft upon the individual. Why? Because in order to acquire money as a person, you have to work to get that revenue. And when the state taxes that revenue, they command your labor in that way. Given that you don't consent to that state, what that state has effectively done is taken the work that you have done, required you to work more, and in addition to not allowing, not allowing you the choice to work, but your girls on either side of the house, they've taken the money you've generated as revenue from that. So what this looks like then is a redistribution of money, of work, from people who are willing to work to people who are unwilling to work. We think this is fundamentally unjustified and means that your basic income is not a right because in order for something to be a right, you have to not reasonably be able to find an alternative mechanism for achieving that. What do I mean by this? I know that this is in part separate to the taxation as theft argument. So, if the state itself is able to provide me with a mechanism for achieving a right by virtue of providing me with a job, then I have the capacity to access that right, right? So, a right in and of itself is the ability of the individual to make a demand upon the government and upon society that something be provided for them. 
We say in many circumstances that fundamental right looks like something like food or education, without which you would die. That's a very fundamental right that the government should definitely provide. In those circumstances, taxation is justified and acceptable because that's a more fundamental concern than the compensation that you're being robbed of. So for instance, if I had to mug someone, which is effectively what the government is doing, in order to save someone's life, that might be morally dubious, but it is acceptable. It's not acceptable in circumstances where that other person has the capacity to choose to live, but choose to neglect that alternative. We say if that's a reasonable alternative, because the government's provided you a job that is safe, that pays a living wage, then it's unreasonable for you to command the labor of another individual. I'll take that POI. Without healthcare, without education, without welfare benefits, we wouldn't allow, to self, allow ourselves to self-actualize as individuals. How can taxation be theft? It is theft. Sometimes theft is justified if that means saving someone's life. It's not justified if that person could choose to live through a very reasonable alternative, right? It's very reasonable for someone if a job that is safe and that pays a decent wage is available to them. One minute. If that's true, it's unreasonable for them to assume and take money from you in order to be alive. But if that alternative doesn't exist, we think that's justified. What that means then is that we think all income, all welfare that's provided by the state should be means tested because then it represents a more reasonable and, a, and meaningful uh, justification of why that taxation will be provided. So let's say, for instance, that you believe that food is a right, and it is. If that's true, then the government has the requirement that you have reasonable access to that food. But it doesn't have to ensure that you get it regardless of circumstance. So if you choose not to work, you're not guaranteed that right because you've been provided a meaningful route to accessing that right. So the right itself is food, but you didn't get a right to specifically one particular mechanism of achieving that outcome. So if the government is able to provide you with multiple means through which to access an end, the end here being food, and the means has been provided through the avenue of a job, then there's no burden on the state to provide you that to you, regardless of if you choose the very reasonable avenue of accessing that right. Wind and up, that please. means that basic income in and of itself is not a right, even if opening government believes that in some circumstances may strategically be useful. Proud to oppose. Thank you, thank you very much to both teams. Can I ask the first speaker from Queensbury Lawrence to open the case uh, for the closing proposition team? Five, five minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, today I'll present, be presenting to you the philosophical case for this motion, proving to you that the opposition is defending a viewpoint which effectively proposes we replace benefits with the death penalty. Firstly, I'd like to pose a question. Why do we work? The common answer is because we have to if we want to eat. But can we see that this is becoming increasingly unnecessary? Under the status quo, um, most jobs are slowly um, becoming, as the opening government has said, uh, unnecessary because machines can do the, those jobs and do them better. Therefore, we are working because we feel we have to, because society says that we have to, not for any logical reason. Um, people, instead of working because they have to, to earn a living, they should be doing what they want. They, sh they should be doing uh, charitable work, arts, um, raising children, all valid uh, ways of spending their time. But instead, they're being forced to work because they have to and for no other reason. Work is not the meaning of life, and currently it is the sole purpose of our life because it's necessary for us to live. One minute. So, uh, no thank you. What we're claiming um, is that the, the consequences for not working are so unjust that we shouldn't be imposing it. So, um, in general, I think we can all agree that the punishment should be appropriate to a crime committed. Uh, people should be treated fairly, it's, it's basic justice, and also um, the general purpose of, uh, purpose of punishment is to fix problems, to right wrongs. In this case, um, not working is not causing harm to anyone else. You're not inflicting damage, pain, on anyone else. It's simply a choice. No, thank you. Um, therefore, these people should not be punished. But what are the consequences of not working? Um, in, in a, a world where there are no benefits, there's no system in place for people that don't work to uh, have a living, then the consequences are starvation through lack of money, the inability to feed family, eventually death. Along with that, social, sh social shame, um, because society doesn't accept that not working is, is a possible option, it's a choice. 
uh, and, the, and they're also forced to give up in their dreams because they have no money or ability to pursue them. Yes, please. Bring us a sense of long-term purpose. Certainly, but that purpose can be achieved in other ways. For example, charitable work, doing good things with your life that actually benefits society more than simply doing a job that a computer could do better than you just because you feel you have to. So, um, let's say, what would happen if um, some people or a lot of people stopped working? People who didn't need to work stopped working. As, as has already been stated, some people would have to pay tax to support you. But... Um, the people that aren't working are then freed up to do useful things with uh, their life. Like I've said, raise kids, do charity work, um, build a community, things like that. Currently, these things are not considered as work. The only reason that they're not considered as work is because they do not create money. However, they're still offering a service, they're benefiting society, they're doing good things. It's just that there's no money in it, so these are not valid options currently uh, for someone to live. In this world that we see, it is feasible for someone to do this as their living, quite rightly, and still make a living off it. At best here, we are punishing um, the opposition, is punishing so-called thieves, um, people who are stealing from the other people that work hard, uh, with conditions that are effectively worse than prison, worse than anything we would inflict on any criminal in this country, worse than a murderer. At the worst, we're punishing good people for doing good things. We're punishing mothers, fathers, people doing charity work. One minute. Uh, people whose only, uh, all they want to do in life is to help people. We are punishing, punishing them with uh, something that is effectively comparable to the death penalty. Something that would only ever be justifiable for someone that committed the worst crime possible, the worst crime imaginable. And does not wanting to spend your days doing repetitive work that you have no passion for, or wanting to do charity work, wanting to raise a family, wanting to help people with your life, does that really constitute that crime? Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. I would now like to call the first speaker from Clifton Vehicle to open the case for the closing opposition team. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir, members of the House. One of the government's duty is to protect its people's right to work. This is because we can recognise the benefits of work to humans that perhaps civilians capable of work won't recognise. Instead of encouraging like robots and the optimization of uh, uh, industries and economies. We protect people's jobs and recognize the benefits that people um, working brings them. Today I'm going to be talking about how people should have a right to work and that the government should be protecting this right to work. Um, but first of all, I'd like to talk about the um, third uh, opposition speech. So first of all, they talked about how this is like, um, we're uh, effectively punishing people who don't want to be working. Firstly, we think like as a government, we're doing something for the good of these people. By encouraging them to be in work, we're actually benefiting them. I'm going to bring you these explicit benefits later on in my speech. We think that like saying we're punishing them and forcing them into the death penalty is untrue. We think that people, if they physically cannot work, we give them benefits and we help them that way, right? So we're not sentencing anybody to death by being opposed to this motion. So what minute. we're doing is following our duty as a government to help people. And I think we follow that as I'm going to prove. No, thank you. In my speech. Um, secondly, they brought us all these alternatives to work that people are going to like actively engage in um, when their motion passes. Apparently, okay. Firstly, we think that we will, we can recognise things like charity work and raising children, um, and we think that it's important that we do. Right? We we, in, we force companies to pay mothers maternity leave, um, we uh, and fathers paternity leave. We think that um, the government can enable these jobs to like be recognised. We can um, create more non-profit jobs for them working in. Our, we're totally in support of that because we think they are benefiting society. However. We think that we're opposed to people simply sitting around their house, having no purpose in their life. And we think that um, uh, that is what we're talking about in, uh, in this debate today. So on to my point about the, uh, how it is the government's duty to ultimately protect the right to work. So we think that work itself is like innate to the human experience, right? It is a part intrinsically of who we are and what we do as, um, as people. So why is this true? 
We think that mentally as humans, we feel like a, like a need to be helping community and helping other people. And we think we feel a real sense of like justice and like fairness when we uh, actively involve ourselves in doing things for the better of other people. And um, I'll take you in a minute. Secondly, we think it fulfills people, right? We think it gives people a purpose to their life, right? And, and when they're 70 years old and look back at all the people that they helped being a lawyer or as a doctor, right? We think that gives them a genuine purpose to their life. And we think that it's really important that um, people have this sort of um, uh, fulfillment in their life. Thirdly, we think that it keeps people engaged with society, right? You have to physically engage with other humans when you're in a job, right? And fourthly, we think that um, work counteracts the human tendency to just slip into like this world of pleasure. Um, yes, please. If what you say is true, and people have this natural desire to, um, to help people, to help the community, stuff like that, then how can you say that as soon as they stop working, they're just going to sit around all day and do nothing? Because we think that the human mind ultimately thinks in the short term, right? It goes to things like, oh, today, you know what, I want to go to see that film in the movie. But we think that in the long term, it's the government's duty to make sure these people are doing the absolute most uh, beneficial thing they can with their time on this planet. Okay, so um, let's talk about the impact on the, this, their side of the house that this motion was passed on the group of people who um, sort of slip out of work um, and don't do anything fulfilling with their time, right? We think they, they ultimately feel empty at the end of the day, right? They don't feel like they've got a purpose, they're not helping anybody, and they're not doing anything to change anybody else's lives, right? They ultimately withdraw from society. There is literally no need to get out of bed in the morning, no thank you. We think without work, the majority of society will be choosing not to work, right? Because it is a human nature to choose activities of pleasure over work. Because fair enough, you don't want to get up at six in the morning, no thank you, to go to your job, right? And you'd rather lay in bed till 12. However, we think as a government, we recognise that there are so many more benefits to the human, um, to the human uh, mind in engaging with work. And we think, um, I'm going I'm to bring you these um, now. One minute. Um, so let's talk about the problems with universal basic income, right? Firstly, we think it allows these corporations to get away with um, turning all these jobs into the jobs of like robots. We think the end goal of companies is to replace human workers with machinery, right? We think that they buy workers off and the, the workers themselves won't be complaining about the fact their jobs are being taken. We think this is actually a very bad thing and we don't support it under our side of the house. Secondly, we think that universal um, basic income sort of facilitates people's ability to just engage with their sort of short-term wants and needs, right? So they can spend the whole day in the house if they so want because the government will be paying them to do so. They think that things, if we think that even if people are doing things that they think will make them happy, right, so like watching movies or drinking or just eating food, we think that people um, are not uh, actively engaging with other people, they're not engaging with society and they're not fulfilling what the purpose on, um, on this planet is, right, so we think that ultimately has huge harms for them in the long term. So we think it is ultimately the government's duty to provide a protection of their jobs and their work because we think Wind that up, work please. brings them um, very good benefit, very uh, big benefits in the long term. We think the government should ultimately protect this right and create laws against the sort of um, the creation of like robots replacing the workers. Right? We think that is a very bad thing. Wind up, please. Um, thank you for listening. I've never been prouder to oppose. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I now call on the second speaker from Queen's Free Lawrence to conclude the case for the proposition? Five minutes. <clears throat> honourable Speaker, honourable friends in the chamber, distinguished strangers, it seems to me that it does not need said that you ought not to punish an individual beyond that which their behaviour has warranted. In a system which values tradition over progress, in a system which favours the interests of capital over the interests of humanity, in a system of capitalism, people are punished every day for one simple transgression, that of existing as a member of the working class in modern age Britain. Where everything OG tells you is true becomes true. I think we provide you uniquely in closing government a principal justification for why this is necessary. OO tell you that tax is theft and that the only thing that can justify theft is protecting rights. I'll respond that even if it were, no thievery should ever engender the sorts of punishment we leverage against those who choose not to work. OO say that we don't consent to the state, but One we minute. also don't consent to a system of capitalism, a system that tells us our domestic labour, our management of community, our raising children, our volunteering isn't meaningful labour, but our presiding over trust funds is. CEO tell us that we have a duty to help people work. I say, I agree. 
I agree that we have a duty to help people work. I think we have a duty to help people find that work which they deem meaningful, that which gives them benefits in their own lives. They want to say that they can claim our benefits without any of the harms we supposedly engender. But I think that buys into a mischaracterization of people. I think when they tell us that people will stand around and be lazy, not do anything with their lives. I think that belies a fundamental flaw in their argument. I think they treat humankind as if we are wandering around meaningless, aimless, in search of a purpose that government needs to provide us. But then I think that their second point tells us exactly why this isn't true. I think they say that people are, people do gain benefits from working. I think we can see that people will gain these benefits from working even if it is not work that is forced, even if it is work that is undertaken willingly, because eventually people will find the need to do something. No person can ever sit around, be complacent, happy with their lives if they are not doing anything meaningful. I would tell you that even if they did, none of the principle has been challenged. It would still stand that even if all the things they told you about people being short-termist and lazy were true. Nothing could possibly justify the consequences we leverage against those who choose to engage in those activities. The analogy we've provided is that even if you do commit theft, we do not punish you with conditions that are worse than that which with which we treat people who choose not to work under the status quo. We think there are principles of justice at play here. I think that is the most important thing in this debate. When CEO, or when CEO tell you that people are short-termist, that government should decide how my time is best spent, and then decide that my time is best spent at a call centre, rather than helping my family, rather than helping my community, I tell you that government has made the wrong decision. I tell you that governments ought not to hold the kind of control over our lives that um, OO say they do unless it is justified, unless we are helping people. I think that Duncan wins this debate for one broad reason. He's able to tell you why, regardless of consequence, regardless uh, of any benefits that may or may not be derived from working, from not working, any punishment that we leverage against people who choose not to is unjustifiable, at least under the way we are proceeding under the status quo. Mark, I'll take you before I move on. Theft is not justified if you have access to a good, decent job that the government provides you, which provides you with a living wage and a good standard of living. Mm. One minute. Theft is justified insofar as it prevents people languishing in a system whereby they can work many hours a week and still not have enough money to feed their families. I think it is perfectly fine to tax people to um, provide this. I also think it's perfectly fine to tax people to provide benefits to people who choose not to work. I think that it should be taken into consideration in this debate that we do not treat people who commit murder the same way that we treat people who choose not to work. I think we can all see in this chamber which of those transgressions is the bigger problem, which has blighted society more. I think insofar as we treat people worse, who have chosen not to work, who have chosen to put their time and energy into other projects, which I've told you they will, Wind up, I think please. that is unjustifiable. I think that if you value our common humanity, if you value people's ability to pursue their own version of the good life, I think you have to propose. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I now call on the final speaker from Clifton Vehicle to conclude the case for the opposition? What we need to prove in this debate is the intrinsic value of work and why that's something so innate that it is a right, a right we have to afford to all members of society, even over the rights that they've presented on proposition. I think we do this uniquely in closing opposition. What's this debate about? Because I think we need to clarify what rights are actually afforded on both sides and indeed what even services are applied, afforded on both sides because it's gotten a bit confusing. We are happy to provide unemployment payments to those unable to work as we do in the status quo. Nobody is starving because they can't work on either side of the house. We're also happy to expand those services so people who work in low-level jobs and can't make ends meet have some additional money so they aren't starving on that end. I think that's a reasonable thing to do. I think Scotland has already taken reasonable steps towards that end, as have all states with the ability and the reasonable stance that that should be done. 
We are also happy, though, to ensure that jobs exist and recognize that's a key difference between our side of the house and theirs. They recognize the inevitability, they say, of jobs disappearing and embrace that future. We stand, however, on a future in which jobs are provided to everyone as a choice they can have. I think we can do this in three ways. One minute. First, we can instigate regulations, as we see working in Japan, where there are strict rules as to what sorts of labor can and cannot be automated. We are fine saying that some industries simply can't be automated and we won't allow innovation in that end to occur. Secondly, we are happy funding public works projects like those brought about by FDR in which large populations are put to work on the large and visual accomplishments like bridges, like roads that have direct value society and that fill them with meaningful work. Even if they prove that everyone at McDonald's loses their job, we're happy to offer them another job on our third side of the house where they can actually find the fulfillment they want so desperately, where they can really provide something that requires that sort of collective action that only the government can motivate with the wages that it provides. Thirdly, though, we would say that some jobs, like carers and teachers, will always be done better by humans, and this offers a deep fulfillment to the people doing them. I do not see a future in which these things are automated because the human interaction is something so pivotal in these roles that it won't go away. We're happy standing on that as well. A few brief points of rebuttal, and then one summary point on the value of work. The first idea we get from closing is this idea that you can do other things, like charity or raising children, and thus add value to society. No, thank you. We would tell you, first of all, that we enable those things in the status quo via maternity leave and via government-funded nonprofits that let people profit from the service that they do get. We're happy expanding that as well and providing jobs that are actually are meaningful, like I've talked about with public works projects. We think that's quite a good thing. But the second response here is that short-term incentives, we would tell you, corrupt people's ability to make meaningful choices about what they actually want to do. Because you get trapped in this cycle of inaction insofar as in the short term it always seems more pleasurable, more immediately sort of like a nice thing to not work, to do something that I want to do today, to watch TV, to not have to do something that I don't want. But that traps you in a cycle in which you're meaningfully precluded from working in the future because you lose skills as the economy moves away from you. Because on their side of the house, now there simply aren't any more jobs left. So if I want to work in the future, that choice is no longer afforded to me. Opening. Going to create jobs through the government, surely this is going to tax, you know, cost tax money. Does this not just go against what you've just said in opening? Okay, well, I think providing a job, we're saying, is a right as fundamental as meets the burden they said was required to tax, so I don't think that's a knife. We're fine with that. Okay, third response to this, I think in the long term, people will want to accomplish things, and this deals with the argument about people wanting to do charity, but they're stopping themselves in the short term. That's the meaningful problem. You get caught in this cycle, you're not going to be able to meaningfully do it, because on their side of the house, you don't force them any meaningful way to actually engage with that. Second point of rebuttal is this idea that this punishes those who don't choose to work. Recognize that not working when you're, enable, when you're able to work represents a fundamental assault on society. It's a refusal to create value and provide for your fellow citizens. We would tell you that this is akin to murder in some sense, insofar as I've stated that my individual preferences not to work outweigh everybody else's ability to have a road, to have the value I'm adding to society. We are fine if it truly is a punishment to punish it in that way. But secondly, we would just tell you that this isn't a punishment to the same extent that they're saying, because there's still a social safety net. They're still enjoying the rights of a society that provides with them roads to drive on and bridges to interact. With. I think this is just fine on our side of the house. We really aren't sentencing them to death, as they say. Final point of summary, the right to work. We would tell you that it's intrinsic to the human Wind psyche up. to Sorry, in the long term... One, one minute. <laughs> cheers. Want the ability to work. We tell you this comes from an ev evolutionary urge to provide for yourself and your community, the sense of accomplishment this affords, and the constant narrative that they talk about, in which capitalism instructs you and tells you that you only have value in so far as you, insofar as you provide labor to society. But we tell you that this also counteracts our most basic urges in the short term towards inaction, towards pleasure, towards complacency, the sorts of things that incentivize us always in the beginning to make that choice not to work, that traps us in that cycle from which it'll be very hard to explain. So recognize that the short-term choice that they're enabling on their side of the house is necessarily coercing your future self and its ability to find the sort of fulfillment that we think is so important. That's why we'd say the right to have that choice to work is the more fundamental right in this debate than the right to choose not to work. Because it's something you're never going to be able to get back and it's something that leads you to an endless path of despair and unhappiness when you remove that from them. We stand on our side very proud to protect that long-term right, protect the right for people to access that sense of meaningful fulfillment and recognize that's something they can never do Wind on their up, side please. when they embrace a future that lacks jobs, that lacks the choice to work. Both sides of the house deprive people of some level of choice. We simply think work is the more innate and the more fulfilling choice to have. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, and I'd like to thank very, very much all eight speakers for their contributions to the debate. Uh, if I could now ask the judges uh, to leave us, uh, to deliberate on what will be, I think, a very difficult decision for you all, uh, and please come back to the chamber in 25 minutes. We now move on to the uh, floor debate. Uh, 
The floor debate will last for 30 minutes. I'll invite speakers from the floor to raise points in relationship to the motion and the debate uh, or to points you have just heard. If you wish to speak, please raise your hand, preferably wave it about as well. Now, if I select you, <laughs> if I select you, you should wait, this is important, please, wait for the red light to come on on your microphone. Then stand, please tell the chamber your name and the name of your school before you raise your point. This is important to wait for the red light to come on so we can capture your contribution. It's also extremely important since we have a prize for the best floor speech of the evening and I need to identify a winner. So if I don't know who you are, you will not be uh, the winner. Please limit your contributions to a maximum of one uh, minute. And if there's time, I may ask uh, the teams to respond or contribute to points from the floor. So if I can open up the floor debate. A very good waving hand just at the back by the corridor. Um, I'll Please take a... Uh, oh, 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 stand up. Joe McTaggart, Kinross High School. I'll take it if anyone, if no one worked, then they won't get pensions at the end of their careers or what would be. And if so, what would the government, mean, what would the government be doing with that money that is being kept? Thank you. We'll let the government respond to that if they, we have time. On the end there in the third row, yes. Um, hello, I'm Fraser McDonald from Perth High School. And tonight I accuse the government of falling for a cleverly disguised capitalist plot. This motion will massively increase the Gini coefficient as it will allow a small 1% to completely dominate the ownership of the labour markets. This is a capitalist plot to keep the poor poor while giving them just enough money to spend on commodities sold by the 1%. Make, and then may, that will make the 1% further richer. And then we hear that the government won't actually tax these rich people. So they're borrowing money to give to poor people to make the rich richer. This is a plot. Please oppose. Thank you very much indeed. At the end of the row here. Yes, you. Yeah. Okay, um, so I think it's a shame that the assertion that taxation is, is fair. Sorry, could we have your name in school, oh, please? Oh, sorry, Christopher Fleming, um, Dundee University. Uh, or university, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so I think it's a shame that the assertion that taxation is theft was not challenged a bit more in the debate. Um, so like, even if um, like people are giving a living wage, as you say, like, the surplus value that they get um, of their labour is still extracted by like, the capitalist um, owners of businesses like, who inherited their wealth through like, systems of exploitation. It's very rare that rich people actually do make all of their wealth um, from scratch. So if we're going down an ideological route, um, you could also say that property is theft as well. Um, by this token, I think that um, taxation as a form of redistribution of wealth um, from the capitalist class to the poorest in society is justified and that workers shouldn't be expected to be wage slaves. Um, so my question is, um, do you think it's fair to expect people um, to work when the vast majority of the wealth that they create is taken from them and given to the top 1% in society? Thank you very much. Uh, the person just at the... Yes, you, if you could stand up. And Sorry, b b in front of you. Um, no, you sorry, sorry, with the glasses on. Yes, <laughs> thanks. Your name and... Uh, I'm Dries Watts from Perth High School. I direct this point to the closing opposition. You said that those who choose not to work withdraw from society and sit in their house doing nothing. However, when the alternative is an overpaid and overworked, an underpaid and overworked career um, that could be easier, easier and more efficiently done with robots. Do you blame their demotivation to partake in work? Thank you very much. Very enthusiastic waiver here just at the corridor. Please stand up. Name Hi, and school um, or university, Archie, please. Okay, I am Archie McLennan from uh, Kinross High School and I am saying I do think people should be should work as well as the fact that it does provide them with motivation it also humans are like primates which are naturally social creatures so if they just sit in their house all day with no social interaction it is entirely possible that they could eventually even just go mad from a lack of social interaction as well as the fact that some people might just be unwilling to work because they're just generally lazy which is unfair on the people who are willing to work Thank you very much. 
we have quite a few waving hands. Could I make sure we have some gender balance here? I'd like some girls and women as well in this debate, not to be dominated by males. Uh, ah. Somebody wave your hand. <laughs> All wave our hands. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> Don't worry, don't worry, we'll be on top of this very, very shortly. Just to, just to, just to let you know, in, in terms of the order, 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 in terms of the lighting, you might be interested to know, ah, here we are. These, these are, of course, new lights uh, in the chamber. They were replaced this past summer because uh, the previous lamps uh, were metal halide lamps which are going to be outlawed by the EU in the next two or three years. So there was only one supplier left making them, and hence we have these beautiful lights. I think this is their first failure. We'll make sure this doesn't happen again. Right, back to the open uh, debate, and I'd like to call uh, the... I was going to call you in the... Polo shirt. Yes, please stand up. A name? Yes, indeed. Up. Oh, yep. Yep. yes. Hello. Uh, my name is James Ford from the University of Dundee. I'll be taking a slightly different point from my comrade over there. So we hear a lot in this debate, with the notable exception of the proposition whip, about these different like right systems, right? So you say like variously that people have like a right to work, a right to food, a right to life, like that taxation is theft, which implies like property rights. But I think it's a shame that there's no real analysis on like first of all what a right is, secondly like why the state has a duty to to enforce rights. Thirdly, like where rights come from, and fourthly, like how on earth we should weigh them against each other. Like, like there's virtually no analysis on this in the entire floor. Um, now, specifically extending that, like to uh, opening government, right? Like you say that taxation is theft, which implies a right to property. But then you say that people have a right to food, which implies like fundamentally that property rights will be violated and that the state has a duty to do this. Like how on earth is there some kind of coherence right system that can contain both of these? And if there is, could you please justify it to the house? Thank you very much. Uh, the person just in from the Kinross High School pupil. Yes, you, yep. Stand um, up name. Rebecca Coles from St. Joseph's College. Um, in Britain, we live in a meritocracy. We earn what we get. I direct this to the government who seem to be willing to just hand out cash that we don't have in an already stretched society to people who, as, to, as you defined in the motion, aren't, don't have the capacity to work, but just are not willing to work. Why should we give money? Why should we give things to people that just cannot be bothered? They are not willing. They don't have the motivation or the willingness to work. Thank you very much. Uh, second from the corridor there. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Uh, one of the main proposition points was the using machines instead of humans. Uh, but we're already doing this with mass production. The problem that both of these forms is that they need to be repaired. They can break and it will cost more money to fix it or even replace them. And it will cost even more with AI like they were highlighting. Uh, how will they tackle this? Uh, I'm Charlie Grant from Denny High School. <laughs> Thank you very much. Back, left way at the corner. Thank you. Hello, I'm David McLean from Our Ladies High School. I heard Stephen. a lot of talk about um, automation, and if we actually look at Karl Marx's theory, he talks a lot about automation, and that's how we're going to go forward. So I don't really see how it's a bad thing, because as... Um, the proposition, like said, it makes things cheaper, so we can actually have a fairer society because we won't actually really need to pay for anything because we are not paying anyone to make it. Thank you very much. Could people please be very clear and, and speak loudly with their name and school or university that will uh, help us. Uh, second in from the corridor, third down with the glasses, yes, yes. If you could stand up, please. Oh, uh, yeah, Beth and Chalmers from Bearsden Academy. I was interested by the idea that the willingness and capacity to work, so capability. So, um, yeah, so we both sides have accepted capability, but I think both the, the capability and willingness are more integrated than that because you know, people keep mentioning people who cannot be bothered, but surely this demoralisation and this, willing, this this sense of disenfranchisement, presumably from a pr uh, previous job that was treated them probably unfairly, um, 
is something that prevents people from capably doing their job. And I was wondering where both houses, um, both sides draw their line between willingness and capability. Thank you very much indeed. The waving hand, second row from the back in the white shirt. Okay, so this question is Could kind of directed name to... please? Oh, sorry, Daniel Gadsby from uh, High School of Glasgow, and this question is directed to really all the sides. And it's the fact that we live in a society today where we are rapidly being faced with the choice, and maybe not tomorrow, maybe not in a month, but it will come eventually, where we must decide, are we going to stop the, proceed, uh, the, pro, um, the proceeding of technology? Are we going to try and... Um, you know, like face it off and like develop as it goes on or are we going to forge a new society which is different? Since the dawn of time, man's uh, need to work has been his meaning in life. Is this what we are going to do for the rest of time or will we need to change to changing world that we're in? And also just quickly to the government, or sorry, to opposition and that's the fact that um, when you face someone uh, with an opportunity to keep themselves alive, um, I feel like, and they don't take it, I feel like that's similar to in a hunger strike, that if they Wind don't up, take please. the food, then that's their fault that they die. Um, take the job and uh, don't take the job and it's your fault that you fail. I don't think that's fair. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I hope the proposition and the opposition are listening to this contribution. I'll give them an opportunity to come in and respond to some of them in a few uh, moments. Third seat from the row from the back. Yes, you. Um, Thank you. Just okay. wait till your red light's on. Name? Okay. Uh, my name's Aubrey Agib, and I'm from Hermitage Academy. So um, universal basic income, or even capitalism, uh, states that I owe you something just because I exist, just because I breathe. Uh, don't you think that... Um, that uh, capitalism would be the more morally just justifiable alternative, which is that, which states that I may not like you or um, disagree with you on a lot of things, but if I give you a product or a service that you want, um, if I don't give you a product or service that you want, I'll starve. Um, don't you think that a uh, voluntary exchange is more um, morally justifiable than forced redistribution? Thank you very much uh, indeed. Uh, at the back there, Yes, you with the red light, excellent. Thank you, please stand up and name. Uh, Finlay Whiteford, Denny High School. Uh, I noted from first and second opposition that they were making a little point that uh, your vote does not count and that you were a slave to the government. Uh, but they failed to see that like, you can be the government, you can be the change in uh, your country. And if, if nobody votes, then we have no government to be a slave to. Uh, we have no overarching power over our lives. Uh, it's a fairly shaky argument, and to be fair, in my opinion, uh, slightly selfish. Thank you very much. We have a lot of people wanting to speak. This is fantastic. Uh, just uh, fourth in. Yes. Just name. That's great. Uh, Abby O'Cansey from St. Joseph's uh, College. Uh, just for the government side, if there are so many people that need this um, um, state income, then where is this money going to come from? Who, who are we going to be left to tax if so many people need this money? And would it not be better to spend this money, um, you know, in you know, people who are not capable of working? Should we not invest that money, making it more able for these people to work instead of throwing up money to people who say they can't work or are not willing to work? Thank you very much. Here, just two in from the, from the gangway. Yes, just wait till your red light's on. Excellent. Uh, my name is Fergus Duggan. I'm from Perth High School. My point is directed towards the government. The government have tried to skirt around the issue of those choosing not to work, and even when they have lightly acknowledged the issue, they have given the illusion that all those choosing not to work are pursuing charitable, artistic, familial, and domestic pursuits that add to society. While undoubtedly this may occur, it ignores the choice fueled by the majority of people who are choosing not to work, and that is just sheer laziness. It also ignores the fact that many people are choosing not to work because they don't need to. In 2008, according to the IRS, almost 3,000 millionaires claimed job, jobless benefits. And the economy is driven by work, whether that's one person with dozens of robots under them or dozens, with, uh, dozens of people with dozens of robots under them. Uh, their income tax, VAT and duty, etc. fund those who choose not to work. What happens when only one person is left working? Do they have to fund the other 60 million people in the UK? 
I beg you to oppose. Thank you very much. I'll take another couple of open speakers, and then I'll ask for one contribution from the proposition uh, and the uh, opposition. Enthusiastic waving hand here. Thank you. Uh, what I have name, heard today, name, oh, name, sorry, uh, Jordan Cavell, St Andrews University. Uh, what I have heard today is not an advocacy for universal basic income, but advocacy for a further increase of a means tested benefits. If a man has the will, but not the capacity, then of course they should be helped. However, if a man has the capacity, but that lacks the will, then where does our duty to help that person come from? If I, halfway through my high school or, or university exams, decided I no longer wanted to work, but I demanded the same grade as those who studied hard, then you would rightly be annoyed because I have not put the work in, but I was, gaining my, I was gaining my grade on the basis of the work of others. Why should other people's studies or other people's work and money uh, benefit me when I have made the conscious choice not to study? Supporting universal basic in income over a means-tested system for those most deserving and those who most need it encourages lacefulness, la la laziness, slothfulness, and ultimately the, destru the destruction of the state as we know it. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, I'm trying to take in people who haven't spoken, so if you wouldn't mind, I can't quite remember who has spoken, but people who have spoken already, uh, please don't put your hand up because we have a lot of people who'd like to uh, speak. Uh, at the back there, second row from the back. Yes, indeed, red light's on, thanks. Name? I'm Mila Strichevich from Heinland Secondary, um, and my point is directed at the government. Um, they just keep saying that people should start a family to fill this void where work would be. Um, and I just, I don't understand why it's ethical to have kids just for the sake of having kids. You know, it's like once that's artificial intelligence takes over, it's our existence as a race is just going to become completely pointless. We're not contributing anything to the earth and global warming is already, that's us having a negative impact. So why don't we just die out as a race if... Artificial intelligence would take care of Thank you very much uh, indeed. And the last contribution before I bring in the proposition and opposition, just for a couple of, are you just twiddling your hair or are you putting your hand up? I think you're just twiddling your hair. Uh, here, please. Yep. Yep, indeed. Yep. Wait for your red light to go on. Thank you. Um, Name? Uh, Andre Bohr, also from University of Dundee, following my colleagues here. Um, I was quite shocked that um, an assumption was left pretty much unchallenged, and that is that artificial intelligence is fundamentally good. Um, I'm quite shocked because the reason what is actually going on with artificial intelligence right now is the creation of weapons of destruction. Um, currently, you've got in the US, um, they're already starting to develop swarms of drones that um, function with artificial intelligence. Um, I don't understand how artificial intelligence can be a sense of progress and how this can actually be good for us. So I'm a bit amazed that the opposition didn't challenge it enough and that the government, the proposition government, actually supported this because I think it's really scary and I'm just amazed it was just left hanging. Thank you very much. I'd like now to give the opportunity to the proposers and opposers to make some contributions to what they've heard. Uh, Yes, please, the first proposer, Perth Ferguson. Uh, just to you address... Stand, stand sorry. please. Yep. Uh, just to address what you just said there, we're not saying that automation is inherently a good thing. We're just saying in modern global capitalism, it's inevitable, and this is the best way of staving off the effects. Um, also, I accuse Fraser MacDonald of using a personal view of mine that I wrote in an article a while ago against me, though I now <laughs> revise that view, and I beg you not to fall for my communist ploys. <laughs> and also... Uh, we heard a lot about taxation. Um, we're talking about who we're going to be taxing. Well, uh, I think it was uh, the, at the third middle row that said, like, look, if there's only going to be one person left out of 60 million or 60 billion, um, are we going to be taxing them? To that I say yes, because they've got the wealth concentrated in those hands, so those are, that's who's going to pay for it. And we also heard this idea of theft. Now, um, if anyone who knows me will tell you, like, I completely disregard the view that taxation is theft. However, it's like... We don't think it's theft, you know, we're, we're providing, um, at the point of which companies need people to buy their products, they're going to want to pay tax to give money to people to spend on their products. So, yeah, I think that addresses that. Why not? Thank you very much. Anyone from the opposition would like to respond to anything they've heard? Please, yep, stand. <laughs> Hello, One everyone. Uh, clearly a group of bright, young, intelligent minds. Um, I think broadly the argument 
from proposition. And I, I, I sort of heard this criticism a few times, right, which is that um, it's not in fact true for whatever reason uh, the taxation is theft. I, I'm of the opinion that it is. I think the question more realistically is not, and the more reasonable criticism is not, is it or is it not theft, but is that theft justified? So the mere fact that you're stealing something from someone, and you know, I, I happen to be relatively left-wing, but the mere fact that you're stealing something from someone um, doesn't necessarily mean that that threat in and of itself is, is itself intrinsically problematic, right? So you can steal for good reasons, you know, Robin Hood or whatever. Um, so I, I think more realistically, though, like, like taxation is itself theft, and the reason why that's true is because uh, I don't think it's true that you meaningfully consent to society or to the state um, at the point at which state chooses to impose a policy upon you. Your capacity to resist that is genuinely relatively limited. I mean, I, I heard something about being the change you want to be in the world. I think the capacities of the individual or even large social movements relative to the capacities of the state is really limited. Yeah? Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we have uh, 13 minutes left in the open, 12 minutes left in the open debate. Plenty of opportunity for people uh, to come in. Please keep your hands up and wave uh, thoroughly. I, you have contributed already. Uh, yes, right at the back there. You, you've not contributed yet, have you? I'm Freddie Bang, Denny High School. Sorry, um, your name? Freddie Bang. Thank you. B-A-N-G. <laughs> yeah, um, the proposition said um, just now, AI is inevitable, and, and they also said that AI is the best thing. Now, I'm assuming that they mean it's not a good thing, but it's the best option that we currently have. But having, employing AI into work would change the way the world works as we know it. We'd have to create new laws to work for robots, and it would be quite a moral gray area, because if you want to think that, oh, robots aren't like people, but if you start making them work, then you have to be like, okay, are there any laws in for if, if they get broken? And if it's AI, that means that it's, it's a self-aware, it's a self-thinking machine which means that that machine might suddenly think, um, well, I want to get paid for this. Because it can, if it's a self-aware machine, it means it makes its own decisions. So I was just wondering if they could say anything about that. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, those waving their hands, some of you put your hands down. Green here, second from the back, red lights on. Name? Hi, I'm Eve Dixon, bachelor from Hindland Secondary School. Uh, this is to the government. What is the purpose of school exam qualifications and university degrees if we don't need them because we don't need to work? I'm sure most of the room can agree with me here that all through school we're told that all these things are supposed to build towards our career prospects. But tell me, what is the point if we have no career and there's no incentive for us at the end to get these things? I'll... I think we'd like a response to that question in due course. Uh, person here in the second row. Name? Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Grant Mack and I'm from St Andrews University. Um, presiding officer, I'm going to do something which you might not like, but um, I'm going to quote former Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, who, <laughs> who once said, the problem with socialism is that you eventually run out of other people's money. And the idea of universal basic income is that someone is going to have to pay for it. And the truth is that, is that if the wealthy are going to pay 80, 90% tax, they're going to leave the country. This is going to shrink the tax base, and it means that there will be no money for the poorest in society. I think the best way to help the poorest in society is to ensure that, that they have a job and to ensure that they keep the fruits of their own labor. I think it's unethical for the state to take vast swathes of people's money. While it's right and fair that people pay a portion of their income to the state to pay for things like free tuition, uh, free health care, it's not right that the state takes all their money. I think it's ethical and right for people to keep as much, to keep as much of their own money as possible while at the same time recognising that you can improve society without uh, giving all your money to the state. Thank you uh, very much. Um, Second row at the back there. Yes, red light on, thank you. Uh, Lucy Crawford Wilkinson, Clifton Hall. Um, so I agree with closing opposition that in the short term, everyone starts low in a bus business or company and they build up. Um, so and they might start low and not have a very good job and not much money, but by building up, they will get better. So by having the um, free income, they won't even get started. 
Thank you very much uh, indeed. Uh, speaker here, you haven't contributed yet, have you? Oh, I have. You have? Yeah. Well, just wait until we can maybe... Yep, up at the back, second row from the back. Please, yes, that's indeed your red uh, light's on. Thank Vincent Kuhn, Glasgow University Union. <laughs> um, speaker, the global poor, no matter which system under which they reside, live under a system of dictatorship. A dictatorship known as no alternatives shackled by capital that was unjustly acquired, or because of a state that makes it a wasteland and calls it peace. They do so because they don't have no incentive nor the capacity to be providing jobs for people. The question I have for Mr. Henry Vico from Closing Opposition then is, where are these magical jobs going to come from? Thank you very much uh, indeed. Uh, plenty of opportunities still uh, for five more contributions or so. Uh, a little wavy hand here just by the corridor. Yes, if you could just, yep, please stand up and then the broad, that red light, thank you, name. Uh, hello, my name's Ross Graham from Queensbury High School. What we've witnessed in this debate is two visions for the future. I think the proposition have clearly shown a very positive vision on the future and how we can support everyone and how we can support them in raising families and doing child work, generally good things. However, the opposition has talked about rightful deaths and how if people choose not to work, then they choose not to get supported or be a part of a community. I think it is absolutely abhorrent if we allowed this negative vision on the future to win this debate, and I urge you to support the proposition. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Uh, I have a contribution just behind that last speaker. Yes. Stand up, red light, name uh, Thank please. you, uh, Ross Brown, Burton Academy. Um, it's just to uh, make the point that now that, uh, as government say that we would now pay everybody a universal income, could this possibly lead to um, a, a, a slippery slope of complacency where we now start to bring in charges for things? Um, somebody brought up, we, we have free tuition, we have free healthcare, we're very lucky to, uh, to have that in Scotland and in the rest of the UK. Could this possibly lead, if we introduce this policy uh, widespread, could this possibly lead to um, a, a reduction of this? Could, th could this lead to mass charges within the NHS? You know, we could all then afford to pay for it, and some people could be, uh, it could end up a, a regressive system. Uh, the poorest would then have to pay more. Um, do, do you think this could possibly happen? Thank you very much. Uh, second row from the back, your hands up. Just wait for the red light. Thank you, name? Yep, Zana Muir, Edinburgh University Debating Society. Um, if I try to be funny, and this might sound like a bit of a tangent, this is a parliament that's meant to encourage diversity and support, so I just want to call out this process for only having one female judge. I think that is unacceptable. Thank you very much. That might have been a point of order. Uh, at the back there, back row. Thank you. Name? Hi there. I'm Keita Maguire. I'm from Holy Cross in Hamilton. Whoop. Okay, up there, all three. Anyway, so uh, uh, we've been postulated tonight with a sort of uh, AI Armageddon where humanity is going to be filtered out. And uh, actually, we've looked at uh, other estimates uh, while I've been sitting here. And I've been thinking, you know, there's a postulation of creating a universally acceptable um, social wage that would require from the working population a 12-hour working week. So unless uh, the opposition can prove to us that, uh, you know, we're going to have a Terminator situation here, uh, we don't think that uh, making AI do all the work for us is necessarily a bad thing. And uh, it was also postulated that, you know, we have to come up with laws to come up with what's acceptable for uh, robots to do. We feel as long as that they're serving the interests of the people and not a benign few, I'm not too worried about Siri's feelings. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. I, I want to allow the proposers and the seconders, members from one of the teams who has not spoken in this open debate, so that would be Clifton Beacle or Queensville Lawrence, to come in at the end, so just get ready for your... For your um, Final contribution in response. I was going to take the blue blazer, just second row from the back. Yes. Thank you. Name? Um, Cameron Rand, Clifton Hall School. Um, proposition, do you seriously believe that someone with a work ethic should be expected to pay for somebody without one? Thank you. Useful question. Please note proposers uh, or posers. And the uh, corridor here, just at the end of the row. Yes. Red light on. Name, please. Um, Lucas uh, Reynoso Name, from Edinburgh University. Okay. Thanks. Um, I was just wondering what we can define willingness as. And willingness is defined as quality of being prepared to do something, readiness. And that suggests to me an ability. And so an ability to be willing. 
So I was wondering if there's kind of a choice, if there's really a choice. Because people, uh, due to the system, due to the, an, an unfair system, might be victims as well because of the lack of access to opportunities. So they must be frustrated, there must be apathy, because they know that with the current system they won't progress. So it's true that there's less incentive for the economy if you can live without subsidy and you don't need to work. And it's true that it's not convenient for the economy. But the state should always remember that they have a duty to protect all its citizens, even if they don't have the ability to be willingness, to, have, to be willing, uh, and even regardless of automatization, debate, or AI. Uh, and that's, yes, thank you. Thank you, you uh, very much. I have two enthusiastic contributors here who already contributed, but they're very enthusiastic, so I propose to let them in. First, yep. Um, I'm Name Rebecca again, please. from St. Joseph's College. Um, I'm furthering the point of the government here, um, f from the uh, uh, opposition, sorry. Do you expect to live in some sort of utopian society where robots replace all workers. I disagree with this. I think that there are going to be jobs. They'll just be different jobs. I think as we go on, new jobs are developing, making these machinery, working on these machinery. And I think that, you know, nurses, all of these ethical, you know, human contact jobs are still going to be there. There are plenty of opportunities for people to work and it all comes down to the point of willingness. If people have the willingness to work, they should work. Thank you very much. And next year, red light. Thank you. Name yeah, again, please. Um, Abby Okantse from St. Joseph's College. Um, I think I can speak for everyone, um, all the school students here, when I say no one wants to study, no one wants to take exams. It's not fun. Um, knowing that I have to work means that I have, I, I have the ambition to be the best that I can be. If I know that I don't need qualifications and I don't need an education, I won't, need, I won't want one because I have an income that... Um, that means I don't have to work. But what I'm trying to ask is, including, um, when we're talking about uh, artificial intelligence, is who do you expect to um, engineer this artificial intelligence if you have a society of people who are not willing to work because they know that there's no point of working because they already have an income? Thank you very much. I'd like now to the opportunity for Clifton Beekel and Queensbury to make a very brief contribution to any of the points you've made. Who'd like to? If you don't want to, you don't need to. Thank you, Queensbury Lawrence. So I think the point that I want to address that's been raised and indeed was just raised is what is the purpose of university? Why will it work if it's not aiming you in a particular direction? And I want to address that because it makes me a little bit sad. I, I think that there is an intrinsic value in study. There is an intrinsic value in going to university and doing things independent of your ability to... Briefly, please. Um, independent of whether that will allow you to get a job in the future. I think you should all bear that in mind going forwards, and I really hope you do. You all seem very intelligent. Um, it'd be a waste not to. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Brief 15, 20 seconds, please. Sure. Um, so I think the question about the definition of willingness, including a lack of opportunity, was a good one. I think in particular, I would say the key comparison to the debate is actually that Government removes the opportunity to work entirely by embracing a future that lacks work, while at least we provide some meaningful work and indeed expand that insofar as your work now can have some sort of direct and visual impact on society, bridges, roads, whatever. Um, I think that choice is inherently preserved in ours, and I think that's more important. So. Thank you very much uh, indeed. So that concludes the uh, open debate. Indeed, that concludes the debate uh, altogether. So thanks very much, all of you, for your uh, contributions, for participating uh, so strongly. We've heard some powerful views on this topic, some arguments that I haven't heard before, uh, some quite persuasive arguments. And so as the judges, I hope, are, I see them there coming forward to take up their seats. Uh, I want to applaud you all and commend you all for the work you've done today. It's an awful lot of work to go through three heats and a final. Um, you've done a splendid amount of work. Uh, very, mu very much impressed indeed. So if you could give your, yourselves all a, a round of applause.
We're now going to announce the, the winners of the 2017 St Andrew's Day Debating Championship uh, final. Uh, if I could invite the minister to come up and join me here. And so when I call your name, uh, please join me uh, and Alex Orr, trustee of the English Speaking Union, on the chamber floor to receive your prize. And we'll also take a photograph before you move back to your seat. So, first of all, uh, I'd like to uh, announce the first prize for the best contribution uh, from uh, the floor. Uh, I want, first of all, to issue a commendation, not the main prize, but a runner-up, if you like, and that's for E.V. Dixon Bachelor, uh, for a very well-crafted contribution, I think, quite on the uh, spontaneous, very much engaging with the debate uh, as it's happened. But this evening, the first prize uh, for the best contribution from the floor goes to Rebecca, if you wouldn't mind coming forward, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well done. Great. Uh, the second prize uh, goes to the best pupil judge of the day, and that is Aidan Shields from Craigmount High School. Well done. Congratulations. Well done. Cheers. Put it again. Cheers. If you stand for a photo. Yep. <laughs> Great, many thanks. Uh, the next prize, which will be presented by uh, Minister Alistair Allen, goes to the best university speaker of the day, and that is Robin Lawrence from the University of Glasgow. Excellent. The final, where are we, Robin? Uh, yes, the final prize goes to the best school speaker of the day, and that's Duncan Riedel from Queen's Ferry High School. <laughs> So now it gives me great pleasure to invite the Minister uh, to, uh, after a very uh, tough uh, final, I think, to present uh, the winner of the runner-up of the 2017 St Andrew's Day uh, debate in Championship, and that goes to Emma Baxter and Henry Vehicle from Clifton Vehicle. And finally, it gives me great pleasure uh, to announce the winner of the 2017 St Andrew's Day Debating Championship is Doa Shabir and Mark Wilson from HSOG Wilson.
So thank you very much indeed to the judges. That can't have been terribly easy. I'm sure you had fantastic deliberations. We don't know what went on behind closed doors, but thank you very much for all your very hard work uh, today. And thanks also to the Minister for joining us, uh, for saying a few words, and for also helping me in give the prizes out today. I'd like now to finish off by inviting Suzanne Ensom on behalf of the English-speaking Union Scotland to say a few words. Thank you. Um, Andy Whiteman, MSP, uh, Minister, everyone here. Um, you've heard a lot of people speaking today, a lot of speeches, and people who are far, far more gifted at speaking than I am. So I'm not going to keep you very long. It's been a long day, but there are some thank yous that I would like to say. Um, days like this don't... Um, uh, don't just happen by accident. There's a lot of time and effort and hard work that goes into them. And there's various people and institutions that I would like to say a big thank you to. So first of all, I would like to thank our sponsors and funders, uh, the Scottish Parliament, who have hosted us um, so well here today, and indeed for the previous 10 years as well. We are enormously grateful to be able to have this event here. Um, I would like to thank the Scottish Government um, for, for, for supporting this event, for funding this event, and the, the effort that, that they put into it. Um, so I'd also like to say thank you to Andy Whiteman for, for chairing, and thank you to Dr. Allen for being here as well. I'd like to thank our panel of judges for the final, Richard Wilkins, uh, Gabrielle Elise, Connor Keir, Aidan Shields, and Alex Orr, uh, but I'd also, of course, like to thank all of the people who judged um, earlier in the day in all of the rounds, which was invaluable. Uh, there were pupil judges, there were student judges, there were teachers, and there were the others who I like to think of as lifelong debaters, um, who also contributed enormously today, and indeed to the competitions that we have um, throughout the year. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the chairs and the timekeepers um, during the debates earlier. I'd like to say an enormous thank you to Connor um, for running the tab for us. It's not an easy job. He was amazingly calm. We were extremely grateful. And again, that's actually not just helping on the day, but helping in advance as well. I'd like to thank all of the students here. I'm very aware that many of you uh, have exams starting, either already started or starting next week. So I'd like to say good luck in your exams and thank you for taking the time to, to be here today. And indeed, again, for, for student support for our programs uh, throughout the year. I'd like to say an enormous thank you to the schools. And when I say the schools, I mean the pupils who are here are supporters, chairs, timekeepers, speakers, the teachers, the parents, everyone from the schools who, who participate in these programs. This, these, are, these programs are for you, but they could not happen without you. Um, finally, I'd just like to say a couple of individual thank yous to some people who've worked extremely hard on this. So I would like to thank Ian Cyril from the government. I would like to thank um, Lindsay Davey, Charlotte Nordlander, Douglas Miller from the parliament. Um, I'd like to thank the ESU staff and trustees and in particular um, I'd like to thank Jess Anderson who I'm afraid is not here today but put an enormous amount of work into this event. And I'd like to say on behalf of the ESU and also personally <laughs> Uh, for, for, for the help this week, a massive thank you to Simon Christie, who um, very much uh, took up the reins at the last minute and has been amazingly hardworking all week, all weekend, and indeed today. Um, thank you for coming. We hope that, uh, I hope that I will be able to say that I can look forward to seeing you all next year. But for now, I wish you um, a very good evening and a safe journey home. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Suzanne. We're not quite finished. I just want to finally pay my personal thanks to Anne uh, and Stephen, my two clerks, uh, for the debate here. And can I now invite uh, Suzanne, uh, Dr. Allen, the minister, the judges, and all the winners to come forward to the well here for a group photograph. All right, sorry, yes.